Job chapter 5, I want you to, uh, as, you as I'm preaching this message this morning, I want you to go back home at some point, uh, Lord willing you will as soon as we're done here, and, and listen to last Sunday morning's message on what's in your temple. Uh, I really believe that this is an addendum to that message, and so I want to deal with that a little bit this morning. Job chapter 5, verse number 17 the Holy Spirit of God says through Job, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Stop. That must be a bad translation. Amen. Why in the world would, hap would, would I would want to be happy uh, whom God correcteth? And you'll understand at the end of the sermon that it's good to be corrected by the hand of God. Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore... Despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Amen. If any child of Almighty God knew the meaning of this text, it would be Job. Job was just coming off a series of corrections that God allowed Satan to do in order that Job would get some things right. But... Job is not our subject today, but the child of the Almighty is. If you're saved, then God is your heavenly Father. And if He is your heavenly Father, then He will have to correct His children from time to time. After all, what good parent would just let his children run roughshod all over him? So this morning, as an addendum to last Sunday's sermon entitled, What's in Your Temple, which I would highly encourage you to listen to in tandem with this one, I would like to preach to you on how God chastens His children in a sermon entitled, Despise Not the Chastening of the Almighty. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the opportunity this morning to be in this place. We're thankful, Father, for... Uh, the construction, Lord, going on. The building's going to look lovely, Lord, after it's all completed. Thankful, Father, for these folks being patient with the parking outside, Lord. That should all be rectified very shortly. Father, thank you for our visitors today, for our guest pianist. So lovely to have her uh, join the choir today and help us out. Thank you, Lord, for the choir number, for the message of the choir number. So thankful for that little babe born in Bethlehem some 2,000 years ago that, Father, we're still shouting about today. Amen. Father, this morning, as we turn our attention briefly to the child of God and how you, as our Heavenly Father, corrects us, Lord, I pray we'd be sensitive to this message. Lord, give it attendance and attention, Father. And we pray that we'd apply it to our hearts. In Jesus Christ's name we ask it, and all of God's children said. I want you to take your Bible and go over to Colossians chapter 2. We're going to kind of stay there for a little bit, but we're also going to do a lot of jumping around this morning because uh, this is, uh, again, I'm kind of off my, uh, my normal gate of kind of preaching a contextual, more of an expositional message. We're going to kind of be in several different locations, but Colossians 2 is where we're going to be for at least the first part of it. But what I need to do very briefly is just repeat an important truth that this church knows uh, that I have often uh, preached on. And it's something that I think needs to be repeated and repeated because it's a truth that, uh, number one, doesn't get always preached on in churches because this passage of Scripture is not fully understood as well as it should be by a lot of preachers. And I think if people would grasp the truth of this passage in relation to the context of which we're dealing with, which is the chastening of the Almighty to His children, then I think it would liberate us in this notion of eternal security and things of that nature. But I want to ask you a question. What happens when a Christian sins? If God doesn't send us to hell, and by the way, if you're a child of God, He doesn't do that, then how does God deal with us concerning our sins after we've been saved? Now, you say, well... It's, that's kind of strange, preacher, because if we're saved, if we ask the Lord Jesus Christ to save us, and He saved us from our past sins, and He saved us from our present sins, 
and He saves us from our future sins, why is there a need at all uh, to confess our sins? And furthermore, why is there any need for our Father to correct us if it's all been dealt with? And I think Colossians chapter 2 is going to kind of help us in that. But can I also say that the Apostle Paul confessed a lot of sins that he did before he was saved, after he was saved? Uh, if you, to, you don't have to go there, but 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul is uh, writing to the, his son of the faith, Timothy, and he says, Before I was saved, I was a persecutor. I was an injurious. I was a blasphemer. And he says, I did this all ignorantly in unbelief. Now, why in the world would he bring all that stuff up? Listen, if you're a child of God and God saved you from killing church folks, that would weigh on you. That would be kind of the thing that nags you in the back of the mind. Now I'm ministering to these folks, but before I used to torture and kill them. Yeah. I think that would probably nag you in the back of your mind. And so he brought those things up again. Uh, when you go to Romans chapter 7, again, you don't need to turn there right now, but in Romans chapter 7, he says, listen, uh, the things that I would do, I don't do. And the things I don't do, those are the things I, those, the things I don't want to do. Those are the things I do. What's he saying? He's saying, in a present tense reality, I still sin. That's right. And so therefore, because he sins in the flesh, because he follows after the flesh, God has to correct him according to the flesh. So what happens when a Christian sins? And if God doesn't send us to hell, then how does he deal with us concerning our sins after we've been saved? Now, let me be clear. As a child of God, God deals with me like a father would a son, not like a judge would a criminal. My sins have been dealt with judicially on the cross. So he is, in one sense, not my judge in that sense. But why would God have to deal with my sins practically? Yeah. You say, well, if, there, if my sins were dealt with judicially, but yet I still practically sin, why does God have to deal with those practical daily sins? Because our bodies, our flesh, has not been born again. And that thing that you're sitting in right now, that you dressed up this morning, that you combed what hair God gave you left, that you put makeup on, that you put a dress on, that you put pants on, that you put a suit on, you put a pair of jeans on, whatever you put on, you're keeping that thing up. It's amazing what you'll do to keep it up. But here's my point. That body that you give so much attention to is what gets you in trouble. That's right. That's right. And that body is not redeemed yet. That's right. So allow me to repeat an important truth from Colossians chapter 2. If you just walked in, we're in Colossians chapter 2. And I want you to look at verse number 10. And again, you know exactly where I'm going with this, but you'll, you'll understand why this is relevant in a moment. Colossians 2, verse 10 says, And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So, if I might just kind of go through a little bit of a theological treatise here for a few moments. The moment you got saved, 
your soul, which, by the way, is the only eternal thing about you. That's, right. That's why an unsaved man goes to hell for eternity. Why? His soul is eternal. Yeah. That's right. Your soul is eternal as well. That soul, the moment of redemption, has been saved. The spirit that was dead in you because of trespasses and sins, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, the spirit has now been made alive, but this body, this flesh, is still dying and is unfortunately subject to corruption. So my soul is born again and is seated in heavenly places. The spirit which basically was like an inner tube with no air that God blew life into. Now it is able to respond to the working of God. But this body, this flesh, this thing that we maintain, it is still subject to corruption. So God, what does He do here in this passage? He spiritually, not literally... But he spiritually circumcises our flesh, look up here, this thing, by cutting it away from our righteous soul. Yeah. Notice what it says in verse 11. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So he severs your righteous soul from your unrighteous flesh. That's right. Look up here. That was not a possibility in the Old Testament. That's right. The soul and body were one. In fact, in the Old Testament, if you've got a good trusty King James Bible, you'll notice that the word soul is used oftentimes for man. Because they were one and the same. But in the New Testament, because of Calvary, God is able to perform now a spiritual circumcision where He severs your righteous soul, places it in heavenly places, and severs it from your corruptible flesh with the sins associated with it. So therefore, no matter how much this flesh sins, and it will, it doesn't affect the eternality of your soul. Amen. Wasn't like that in the Old Testament. That's right. But it's like that now. The Holy Spirit... Now, here's where you're going to probably take a double take for a minute, but I want you to listen closely. The Holy Spirit now takes up residence in my soul which is called in Ephesians 3.24, the new man. Yeah. In another place, he's called the inner man. Yeah. So what, is, what am I saying? I'm saying that the real you isn't what I'm looking at. That's right. That's right. Th that thing's getting old and it's going to decay yeah. and be put into a box. That's right. Someone's going to put you to bed with a shovel one day, folks. <laughs> and, and that's just the way it is, unless you want to go to the cheap route. But anyway, the fact is, the Holy Spirit now takes up residence in your soul, which is called the new man in Ephesians 3.24, or the inner man. The soul is your holy of holies. That's right. Say, so you just got Old Testament. Now, I just got Bible. Amen. See, the Old Testament tabernacle, just go back to this principle again. Old Testament tabernacle, think of it now. You had an outer court. There were two things in that outer court. Yep. There was a brazen laver where the sacrifice was placed on. That's right. And then there was the water laver where the priest would ceremonially wash and look at themselves and then go up those steps into the holy place, right? Yep. So they had an outer court which represents your body. That's right. That's your body. Yeah. You, you, can't, you have to deal with the body before you can minister. That's right. So the only way you can deal with the body is to go through the sacrifice that's in that outer court. That's right. You can't even access the holy place, let alone the holy of holies, unless you get through that sacrifice. That's right. So you get through that sacrifice, and then you have, if you want to just say ceremonially, you have got baptism there the waters of baptism, or the, wadding, uh, the washing of the water by the Word, Ephesians chapter 5 and Ephesians chapter 6. And then before, when that happens, now you can actually minister in the holy place. That's right. But even in the Old Testament, even if you did all that, you couldn't get in beyond the veil 
unless you took precaution. Amen. So the outer court represents body. The inner court, the holy place, where you've got the table of showbread and you've got the uh, brazen lamp, the, the lampstand, and you've got the other instruments in there, you've got the uh, incense, that represents spirit. That's right. But then beyond that veil is soul. Yeah. The holy of holies where the spirit of God indwells. That's right. Now, Man was created with that same composition. The outer court is your flesh. The inner court is spirit. The holy of holies is your soul. God not only laid out that tabernacle in recognition of his son, but he laid it out in recognition of his sons. Man was created with that thought in mind. Outer court is the flesh. The inner court is spirit. The holy of holies is your soul where God the Holy Spirit dwelt. Now, let me just make this very clear. And this is where some of our friends in the past got this messed up. God, the Holy Spirit, does not indwell this. God does not, incorruptibleness does not indwell corruptibleness. If that was the case, then why would I need to change 1 Corinthians 15? Remember, when I get changed, incorruptible, uh, excuse me, corruptibleness puts on incorruption. Then I can be like him. But until then, I am still subject to corruption. So God the Holy Spirit doesn't indwell this. He indwells the holy of holies in my temple, which is in me. You say, how do I know he doesn't indwell this? Same author, Romans 7, verse 18 says, In my flesh dwells no good thing. That's right. Amen. Don't put the Holy Spirit in this. Put him where he's always dwelt, between the cherubim. Amen. Beyond the veil, which now you have access to. That's right. So then, since my soul has been made righteous by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, God sees me as righteous 100% of the time, no matter what your flesh does down here. He does not and he cannot see my sins because Jesus paid for them. So if I sin, and I do, and you do, I do so in the flesh. Amen. Because the new man cannot sin. So then, if I sin with my flesh, because that's where all your sin is, by yielding to its sinful and unsaved desires, then God will deal with me according to my flesh. He's not chastising my soul, that's redeemed. He's not chastising my spirit. Now my spirit's being chastised because I'm not abiding in the Lord because my flesh is leading me. So now I'm not giving its proper ministry. You say, what does that comport to? Uh, The holy place where the priest ministered mainly, right? So my spirit will lack spiritual vitamins. Why? Because this flesh is, it's what I'm following after. So, he's not judging my soul and he's not judging my spirit, but he is judging my flesh because that's what I'm going after. After all, my flesh has been circumcised from my soul. That's right. Say, why was that all relevant? I'm going to tell you why that's all relevant. Because you're a three-part being that can only be explained that way. It's impossible to explain it any other way. You say, well, wait a minute. I heard some guy say I'm a dichotomy. That guy's a liar. (laughs) Well, maybe he's not a liar. Maybe he doesn't know. Perhaps he doesn't know. I shouldn't say he's a liar. (laughs) Maybe he is. But maybe he's one of those guys that just like to say this. Well, you know, Bible says you could be a trichotomy. Bible says you can be a dichotomy. Listen, man. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I pray, God, your whole soul... Spirit, 
and body be preserved blameless. Go back to Genesis chapter 2. The Bible says he created man out of the dust of the ground, body, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, spirit, and man became a living soul. You can prove this thing all the way back in Genesis chapter 2. Don't even waste your time in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. By the way, don't waste your time in a theological book that can't get that right. Waste more time in the book and less time with the guys writing about the book. And you'll find out a lot more here than those guys seem to know over there. So then, say, why was all that important to explain? Because I want to give you an example of a sinning saint. Now, I could probably just point to any one of you. <laughs> Because you're all sinning saints. Amen. You say, can I be a saint and a sinner at the same time? Exactly, you can. Uh, in fact, every book in the New Testament is addressed to saints who are all sinners. By the way, written by a saint who's a sinner. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we dealt with this slightly last week. Or just touched on it briefly, but I want you to look at it. Remember, we talked about this guy that the church at Corinth did not deal with, that they left in the church there who had, had committed fornication. Remember? Yeah. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 1. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is as, uh, as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Now, Paul starts off by chastising the church by saying, this is even a sin that the heathen pagans outside of the context of church and salvation won't even do. He says, you guys are a bunch of sorry saints. A bunch of sorry sinning saints. And then he says in verse 2, you're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. He says, you should have performed a little bit of spiritual discipline here. You should have either got this guy to repent of his sin, and if he didn't do it, you get him out of the assembly. Verse 3, For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, Paul says, have judged already. Basically, Paul says, I wasn't, I'm not even there. All I did was hear about it commonly reported, and I already know what you should have done. As though I were present concerning him that hath done this deed. Now I want you to notice what it says. Concerning him, this isn't a church problem, this is a him problem. Yeah. Now it became a church problem because they didn't deal with it. But notice what it says. Concerning him that hath done this, what does it say? Deed. Here's your problem. You follow the deeds of your flesh. And God's got to deal with you if you do the deed. Now look at verse number 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 5, look at it, to deliver such an one unto Satan. Stop. Look up here. Don't read the rest. Isn't that what God did to Job? Yeah. You say, why did we start off with Job? We're over here. I'm coming back around to that stuff. Isn't that what God did? Look up here. Job's resume was given to you by God in Job 1. That's right. One that feared me, eschewed evil, right? right? I mean, God said it two or three different times and at least twice to Satan himself. Yep. And here's what God said to Satan. I'm going to go ahead and basically deliver him unto you, but you can't take his life. So can we say that God delivered his own child up to the devil? You say, I don't like that kind of preaching. That's too bad. You ought to hear it more often. Here is a man who has been charged with living sexually with his father's wife. And I, as far as I'm concerned, that's pretty bad. Yeah. Some might even think, well, he should go to hell for that. Oh, oh, of course, until they do the deed. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they got grace. But let me just say this. A guy that automatically just relegates you to hell for sin, 
is not thinking biblically. Because that kind of response is like a judge dealing with a criminal and not like a father dealing with a son. Now, look what Paul tells the Corinthian church to do with this guy. Verse 5. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the... Stop up here. It's the flesh that got him in trouble. So it's the flesh we have to deal with. He didn't say, deliver his soul before me so I may judge it right or wrong. He didn't say, his spirit, I'm going to take out that air of life that I breathed into at the moment of redemption. I'm taking it out from myself. No, no, no. He says, to deliver such an one for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Then he says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Amen. So this guy's flesh got him into trouble, so God deals with him according to his flesh, and Satan gets the job just like God gave the job to Satan with Job. That's right. Now you say, why is all that relevant? Galatians chapter 5 says this, Whatsoever a man reaps, that shall he also sow. Right. By the way, that law or that principle of sowing and reaping is for unsaved people and saved people alike. But unsaved people get chastised in a different way. If they remain unsaved, they go to hell. As far as I'm concerned, that's pretty good chastisement. But the child of God doesn't go to hell. So he's got to get a whipping down here. Right? Amen. If you're following your flesh, if you're walking after your flesh, the Bible says then you'll of your flesh reap corruption. That's right. So God's got to do something to you down here after all, what good father would let his children run roughshod over him? That's right. You say, give me some examples. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. There's God was thinking of coffee at this particular juncture. Hebrews. All right. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. It's like Henny Youngman. Take my wife, please. All right. He Hebrews chapter 12. I get no respect. That was Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12. Look at verse number 4. Everyone there say amen. amen. Good. That's not where I want you. Look at verse 6. No, look at verse 5. Okay. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now that's a, a semi-quote from Job, where we began. Now I want you to look at verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. You're probably thinking to yourself, boy, I wish he'd stop loving me so much, amen? But anyway, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Evidently, God did not uh, talk to Dr. Spock before he had this written down. Uh, that's getting old. In the 80s, that was big, but evidently it's not as big anymore. Verse 7. If you endure chastening, by the way, let me just read that again very slowly. If ye endure chastening. You say, what does that mean? You've got to endure it. I remember one time, <laughs> my dad whipped me with his belt. My dad whipped me with his belt a whole bunch of times. Um, I remember one time that he uh, whipped uh, my, my middle brother, David, for doing something stupid. And uh, I was part of the stupidity. But I could hear David yelling in the other room. See, I felt the punishment was sufficient enough just to hear him yell. And just say things in there that were just not meant for godly people to hear. And I thought that was enough. But I'm like, any second now, he's going to shut that door and open this door. And then I'm going to get it. And for the next, I don't know, which seemed to me like eternity, I had to endure. Now, here's the, here's the interesting thing. It all always came to an end. It always did. And my dad was one of those. Now, my dad's still not saved. 
Uh, but, but, but here's the thing about my dad. He could explode with volcanic eruptiveness. And then 15 minutes later, want to hang out and go fishing. No, I'm still mad at you. But the, he's that kind of guy that he could explode and then be, then be okay. Well, here's the thing about God. If you endure chastening, God deal with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Now, let me just stop real quick. If you haven't had the chastening of God, then you ought to, you ought to be concerned. Yeah. Now, I'm going to give you some examples of chastening in just a second here. But notice again verse 8. But if he be without chastisement, whereof all your partakers... Whereof all are partakers. You see what it says there? Yeah. We're all partakers of chastisement. Right. All of us. Yeah. He says, then you're bastards and not sons. In other words, if you're not a partaker, then you're bastards. You're not one of his. That's right. So there are only two groups here. You're either an illegitimate child or you're a son of God. Amen. Furthermore, notice what the uh, writer of Hebrews does here. He brings up a human illustration, an earthly illustration. Furthermore, we had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence yep. shall we not much uh, rather it be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live Amen. well yeah that's a good logical point we reverence the fathers who belted us yep. so why not reverence the God who belts us yes, right. even more yeah. now God deals with his sons but he is not concerned with bastards yes. because they will get theirs in hell. Yeah, that's right. But we don't go to hell. Amen. So we've got to get something here. Yeah. Now look at first, go to 1 Corinthians 11 now. We're all going to put this together. Calm down now. He says, ah, where are you going, preacher? You just stick with it. I know where I'm going. You're along for the ride. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11. Look at verse 31. This is in the context of the church at Corinth not observing the Lord's table correctly. Now, I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 11 and look at verse 31. Now, I want you to listen to these words, verse 31 and 32. For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Amen. Now, that's a good thing. Do you know who's the most... You know who's the biggest judger of all? Myself. I have just, I can judge myself just a bum sometimes. By the way, you probably should do that as well. Look at verse 32. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Notice there's, if you judge yourself, that's good because you're being judged by the chastening of the Lord so that you won't be condemned with the rest of those illegitimate people out there. That should be a good comfort, by the way, because that just separated you from the rest of them. Now, let me just say this. You wouldn't send your children to hell for the sins committed in the flesh any more than God would send his children to hell for sins committed in the flesh. My father never sent me to hell. That's right. I thought I was in it for a brief moment. <laughs> but it all went away. The welts went away. Yes, yeah. welts went away. Right. Yeah. You say, was it always orderly? Not in my unsaved household. <laughs> Whatever was in hand's reach. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you say, do we do that in our household? No. We've thought of it, but we try to do it as orderly as we can, as orderly as we can. We try not to make the same mistakes. But listen, you wouldn't send your children to hell for the sins committed in the flesh any more than God would send his children right. to hell for sins committed in the flesh. Yeah. If you got a fleshly sin, then God's going to deal with you according to the flesh. Your earthly father deals with you the same way. Amen. Now... As a believer, you should be conscious of the fact that you are not your body, but you are inside your body. That's right. 
You say, what am I doing? I'm going back to that spiritual circumcision. The new man is in you. He's your soul. So, as a believer, you should be conscious of the fact that you are not your body. You are inside your body. Allow me to illustrate that for you. You're like a prisoner chained up to his cell. Lonely and miserable. You can't do anything. You're chained to the cell. You're not in the cell. You're chained to the cell. Then one day, someone comes in and cuts your chains loose, allowing you to move freely in your cell. You, you are no longer chained to the wall, but you are still in the cell until someone comes along and frees you completely and eternally. So geographically speaking, you are still stuck to your flesh, the cell. Until the Lord calls you home, you don't come out of that cell. That's right. But until then, you have access. You have freedom in that cell. You're, you're able. The soul's been cut loose That's right. from the flesh. But the flesh still needs to be changed. But until then, you're still subject to the sins of the flesh. That's right. You say, what will God do to me? God will do everything. Anything that your parents did to you. That's right. See, don't overthink this. Don't think that God is going to send a fiery scorpion yeah. right. and start stinging you. Yeah. Don't take those Old Testament pa uh, uh, principles and say, well, that's going to happen to me. Uh, you know, uh, God's going to uh, fire and brimstone and all that. No, but let me tell you what he'll do he'll take your car. You say, wait a minute. What, mom and dad never did that to you? They never took your keys? Because you weren't trusted there? Because of where you were going with it? Or what you were doing with it? Your parents never did that to you? Because my Heavenly Father do that. Here's what my Heavenly Father would do. My Heavenly Father would take a nice 1990 Chevy Suburban. with bling bling lights on the inside that could seat eight comfortably without complaining. Yeah. And when I met my wife, she made me sin a lot. And so, <laughs> when she, the woman now gave us me. She was in high school when I met her, because I, I robbed cradles. And um, she was in high school, she was attending Cal, Cal High, and I was going to a lot of her basketball games on Wednesday nights. Now, I know some of you don't have that same dilemma here. But uh, I know where I was supposed to be because my preacher knew Wednesdays and Sundays I was at church. But for several Wednesdays, I'd missed services. In fact, my pastor kept saying to me, he said, where you been, man? Where you been? Oh, it's been out. So one particular game... God said, I'm taking the keys away by taking the truck away and leaving you just a piece of the steering column and the broken window. Now look up here. Here's how I know it was God. I put it in the first parking space under the light. It's the first vehicle you see with a light right over it. And God took the keys away. You say, why? He was dealing with me according to my flesh. He didn't send me to hell. He didn't take my spirit away and suck it back into His glorious body. No, no. He dealt with me according... Because if I walk in the flesh, then of the flesh I reap corruption. That's right. So he took that car away. What did he replace it with? A two-seater stick shift Chevy Blazer S10. Humbling. 
Two-seater. Did I say that? Two-seater. The other one's seated eight. Let me, let, me, let, me th let me throw another one out there for you. God will send sickness your way. People get sickly. Look at the context of 1 Corinthians 11. Look at verse 30. For this cause many are weak. And, 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 and notice the word sickly. Yeah. It didn't say sick. It said sickly. Say, what is a sickly person? Someone who just always seems blah. Yeah. Now, they're never like totally 100% healthy. And they're never really totally 100% unhealthy. Right. They're just kind of like... But the doctors can't find out what's wrong. Right. And no medicine is taking care of it. That's right. And you're and you're taking apple cider vinegar with the mother. <laughs> and you're you're doing everything you can to get health back, right? But have you ever considered maybe your heavenly father is dealing with you? That's right. Because there's something in the flesh that's got you all hot and bothered. And so he kind of does something to your flesh to kind of take away a little bit of that desire. Yeah. It's amazing how a lot of desires go away when you get sick. Yeah. And there's only one thing you want to, really want is to get better. Yeah. You say, well, God do that kind of stuff? You need to read your Bible carefully. It's in there. You say, why preach this? Because we all need it. Because we all need it. Because we all are led away by this dying, corruptible flesh that we dress up and we make it look good and we get our haircuts and we, we do all the things that we do and we buy $90 makeup kits to dress the barn door up I mean, if it needs painting, I mean, go ahead. But the fact is, I mean, the fact is, folks, this thing's, this thing's, this maggot food, man. That's right. I'm not saying I don't want you to come tonight looking horrible. <laughs> Please, by all means, dress up, look good. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. Don't be led by it to every pile of excrement that it leads you to. That's right. So well, that's a little too blunt. Paul used dung. Yeah, that's right. You ought to read your Bible. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, and if you think it's anything less than that, then maybe you're thinking a little too much of your sin. Yeah. Because it's worthless. Amen. I wonder how many, of, how many of you this morning God's dealing with in this fashion. Maybe he hasn't taken your keys away. Maybe he hasn't made you sickly. Sometimes, according to the Bible, he can just kill you. If, you. if you don't get the hint, he just numbers up, buddy. I'm taking you home. But he'll deal with you in different ways. Just think about how your parents dealt with you. And then say, you know what? God can do the same thing. But for a spiritual purpose. Father in heaven, we thank you for the word of God. And I pray that every individual today would not despise the chastening hand of Almighty God. We're not supposed to despise it, Lord. We're supposed to welcome it. Lord, it means that we're your child. I guess chastening can be both a blessing and a blight. It's a blessing because, well, you love us enough to correct us. That means we're yours. But the blight is, we have to endure it. And Father, I'm so glad that you deal with me as a father, as a son, not as a judge, as a criminal. I'm so glad that when I got saved, you cut away my righteous soul from my unrighteous flesh and separated my righteous soul from the sins of my flesh. Help me to be reminded that I am not my body, but I am in my body. The real me, the inner man, the one who 
thirsts after righteousness, the one who thirsts after the Word of God, the one who thirsts biblical church, the one who thirsts walking righteously and holy and living a life that is pleasing and soul winning and all that, Lord, that's the inner man. The outer man loathes it. The outer man wants nothing to do with any of those things. And we, when we let that outer man lead us around and control our Christian living, we become very worldly Christians. <coughs> Father, I pray that you would deal with us this morning. I don't know, Lord, everybody's situation in here today. But if they're anybody like me, they've had the car keys taken away. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning.